Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pathways. <laughs> Thank you for standing. Um, can everybody else please stand for our first song? Today, I want to honor a special person. 
Jerry Godby here.
together in prayer. Our response to each request is, Lord, hear our prayers. What joys and concerns do we bring to God today? <laughs> do you have a joy? Yes. We see it on your face. I became a grandmother for the first time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Loving and gracious God, we thank you for the birth of Leah Ann. We thank you for this new little life that you have brought into the world, and we ask your blessing upon her. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Other, yes, dear. And prayers for Roland Mott for us if we have surgery this week. Lord, we lift up Roland to you as he goes in for surgery this week. We pray that you would be with the doctors and... All the care team, Lord, may his surgery go well and may his recovery be quick. Lord, hear, hear our prayers. prayers. Other joys or concerns? Are there any online? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Let's continue in prayer, friends. Gracious God, today we lift up to you Pastor Karen, Jen and Donald Castor, Renee Desper. We pray for Ralph Evans, for Lindsay Fiore. For Eleanor Gadosic, for John Hartley, Lynn Molesky, for Roland, for John Murphy, and Tom Tone. Lord, hear our prayers. prayers. We pray for all of those who are homebound or in a nursing home. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We pray for our members and friends serving in the military and their families. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. God of mercy and grace, we ask that you would pour out that mercy and grace upon our friends, our families, our community, our nation, and our world. Lead us all to green pastures and still waters. Show us the pathway to life, not war or division or death. Fill us with the sense of your presence, Lord, and help us to trust in your goodness. This we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. She's praying, Dorothy. She's praying. <laughs> I'd like to invite Brian Ackland up to give us a minute permission. Hi. Um, those of you who have a box of giving envelopes may have seen this envelope in the front of it and wondered what it's about. Those of you who give online and don't have a box of envelopes probably will wonder what on earth I'm talking about. So I'm talking about per capita. And this is an offering that we make to the wider Presbyterian Church. Now our church here doesn't sort of exist in isolation. We're part of a presbytery called Coastlands Presbytery. They're part of a synod in, the, synod in the Northeast, and that's part of the General Assembly, which is the whole wider Presbyterian Church in the USA. And by giving in this offering, we're supporting the work of that wider, wider church, which we're a part of. Now, you might think, well, look, we've got our own budget problems here. Why are we giving money to this, this big organization on top of us, right? And it turns out that we actually get a lot of benefit from being part of the uh, of the church, and so I can see what you're saying, um, from from the work that's done by the higher levels of our church. For example, pastoral care of our pastors. Um, there's a committee on ministry. You know, we all have a pastor. We have Pastor Natalie, right? Who does Pastor Natalie go to when she wants pastoral care and advice? She goes to the committee on ministry, and people there act as as her pastor. Um, calling a new pastor. Um, when we went through the process of looking for a new pastor back a few years ago, how does that happen? How did we hook up with Pastor Natalie? Well, we filled out forms that described who we were and what we were looking for, and she filled out a form describing what sort of church she was looking for, 
And then the organisation at the national level, the General Assembly, put those two things together and we came out with such a great pastor. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a system that really works. Um, you see some others there, resources for various activities that we do, leadership training, youth activities. Every three years there's a triennium that we often send youth to, which is a tremendous experience for those youth to go and be part of that national community uh, in the Presbyterian Church. Um, Presbyterian disaster relief, special grants. Some of you participate in the yacht group that we've set up here at church. And that was started financially with a, uh, with a grant from, that came to us from the higher church. So, so how does this work? Well, it turns out that our presbytery asks all the churches in the presbytery to contribute $40 per member of their congregation. Now, we have 183 members, and that means that we would be giving them $7,300, roughly. That's a lot of money, and when we prepare the budget, that seems to be an overwhelming amount of money. And so what we do as a church is we have committed to pay two two and $2,500 out of this year's budget towards that. Now, to help us do that, many of the members that we in our church pay their own per capita. In other words, make a donation of that $40 to help us make that offering. Right. And uh, so to the extent that we can sort of help out doing that, that eases our situation with the budget. If we collect more than the $2,500, then all of that goes to, to the higher church. So what I'm going to ask you this morning is if you are able, could you please help us to meet and exceed this commitment that we've made to the broader church? Those of you that have offering envelopes, there's an envelope in there. I've also put a few on the table out there those of you that give electronically that don't have access to one of those envelopes. So um, please please help us in this act of a wider mission of our church. And if they do give electronically, they need to make sure to mark it per capita. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Yes. Or, or if you just write a check without an envelope, just put it on the check. Thank you. Thank you.
Anybody have a word or phrase you want to just throw out there that jumped out at you? Yes, Chris. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Anybody else? The stores. The stores. Yeah. Anybody else? Leads. Leads. All right, let's close our eyes again and listen to it again and ask yourself, what are you saying to me in this passage, God? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Open your eyes. Anybody in just a word or two hear something from God? God telling us something. Anybody? Yes. He restores my soul. Yeah, that God's restoring us. God's restoring us. So what we've done there is a very ancient way of reading and studying the Bible. It's called Lectio Divina. And the key to it is reading the passage out loud three times and listening for God's word to you. There's something about hearing the Bible read out loud that makes it more meaningful and powerful. And you can do this with any Bible passage. So I encourage you to do it with one of your favorite stories. Now, Psalm 23 centers around the metaphor of God, the Good Shepherd. Now, I wonder who has seen sheep in person? <laughs> Anybody seen sheep? Yeah. Okay, the first time I saw sheep, I was a kid at my friend Berna's farm. And she had a bunch of sheep. And I got to tell you that even as a little kid, these animals did not impress me at all. <laughs> <laughs> They were loud, they were smelly, they seemed to be kind of wandering around aimlessly. That is until Verna's dad called them to herd them into the pen. Now that was a sight to see. All these sheep following the voice of their owner, their shepherd. It made me understand Psalm 23 and John 10 and Jesus' words about the sheep knowing the voice of the Good Shepherd. Now, sheep may be really simple animals, but they know to follow the voice of their protector. They know how to follow their shepherd. The question is, do we? Do we know to follow the Good Shepherd do we actually follow the Good Shepherd? Because that's the way. That's the way to green pastures and still waters and right paths. Following the Shepherd is our pathway to life. Now Psalm 23 is such a beloved and powerful psalm. I wonder how many of you know it from memory. Anybody just know this in their heart? Many people do, even if it's a different version than what I read. Most of us have heard it read out loud before, often at funerals, because it's a powerful message of comfort. And these words might come to your mind during hard times. Sometimes even people with dementia know this passage when their memory fails in every other way because it is so powerful. It's one of those Bible verses that I feel like, as a pastor, that everyone should memorize. We hear these words at funerals a lot because the psalm offers special comfort to those who mourn. The most famous version of this passage is the King James Version, and it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, this is peace and comfort for those who are grieving. But that phrase can also be translated the way I read this morning, though I walk through the darkest valley. In other words, these are promises, not just at the time of death, but for all of those valleys in life. That makes it a universal psalm. Hope and comfort for any kind of problem that we face. This is a psalm for all people and all of life. I mean, who doesn't need God's protection and provision? Who hasn't felt fear or doubt or alone? Doesn't everyone need God's help? And these are words not just for us as individuals, but for us together as a community. This psalm harkens back to God's protection and provision for the Israelites as they wandered for 40 years 
in the wilderness after they escaped Egypt. When the psalmist says, I shall not want, that word for want is the very same word in Deuteronomy 2, a verse that says, For forty years the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. It also reminds us of God's presence for the people in those forty years by being a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was their reminder that God was always with them. To hear the words, I shall not want, for us today in 2023 is also very powerful because we live in a society that says we should want a lot of things. We should want things like electronics and clothes and food and homes and cars and more and more and more. But just like Jesus who spoke to that rich young ruler in Luke 18 and said, you lack one thing, go and sell what you have and follow me. The truth is we don't lack lots of things. We only need one thing more than anything else in the world. And that one thing is God. We all need God. And this passage is saying we have that one thing right beside us. We have God. God is near. In verse 4, the psalm shifts from talking about God, the good shepherd, to talking to God, the good shepherd. It goes from third person to second person. And the psalmist says, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, this is a personal relationship between us and God. It's also a description of Jesus because Jesus was known as Emmanuel, which means God with us. Theologian Walter Brueggemann says, this is our key to life. God's companionship with us transforms every situation in our lives. Think about that. How does knowing God as your good shepherd change your life? How do you experience God as a constant companion? How does God help your stress or your pain? That whole psalm turns on verse 4. You are with me. That's the essence of the psalm. God is near. God is not some far off God who's just watching everything happening on earth. God is actually right here beside us. We're never alone. What does that mean to you? In verse 5, we see God the Good Shepherd become God the host. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What does that image of God the host mean to you? Think about what you see in your mind when you hear those verses. Does it mean that you get fed while your enemies do not? Does it mean that you are protected from your enemies? <coughs> In the Upper Room Devotion, Mandy Sayers writes about God preparing a table before us, and she imagines God preparing a very fancy dinner with white tablecloths and fancy dinnerware, and while she feasts, her enemies are standing against the wall of the restaurant watching as she eats. But then she asks, does that image make sense with our God? Or... Could the feast be a table where we are eating with our enemies? What kind of table would Jesus set? Didn't he eat with the sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes? So what if a table before our enemies means we're at a table with them? Because all of us are broken and fallen and all of us are an enemy to someone else. What does that kind of table mean to you? And what if this is a way to redefine the meaning of friend and enemy? What if God's table is big enough for all of us? What if this image of an overflowing cup and flowing oil means that all of God's people are welcome at God's feast? It makes me think about a very powerful scene of communion in a movie. It's at the end of a 1985 movie with Sally Field called Places in the Heart. 
And the movie is set in the 1930s in Texas, and Edna is a widow with two small children trying to save her farm with the help of a blind boarder and itinerant black handyman. And the whole movie is about struggle and segregation and poverty and friendship. But at the end of the movie is a scene in the local church. And it has people from throughout the movie, dead and alive, sharing communion while the choir sings in the garden. All of the townspeople are in the pews, including a woman who died in a tornado, Moses, who fled town, Edna, who passes a communion tray to her deceased husband, quietly saying, peace of God. And with that same blessing, he hands it to Wiley, the boy who accidentally shot him and was then himself shot to death. And after Wiley replies, peace of God, the hymn ends, and so does the film. It's this beautiful scene of a table set in the presence of our enemies, of God's feast where all people are welcome and all can eat. It's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet where we will all eat together. You know, if we take Psalm 23 seriously, we start to see that God provides everything, that God is our protector, our provider, and God is in control, which is actually a revolutionary idea. Because we usually live like we are in control. And we are the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Psalm 23 can reorient us, you know? It can move us away from the center of our lives and put God there because God is the one who makes all good things happen. God leads us to the green pastures and still waters. God protects us. God makes that banquet table for all of us. So could you use a reorientation of your life? I know I can. I need God to be the center of my universe. Don't we all need that? Isn't that our pathway to life, the abundant life that Jesus promises us? Psalm 23 ends with a promise that God's goodness and mercy will follow us. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. That that word for follow actually means pursue. In other words, God's goodness comes after us. If we think we can escape the grace of God, we are wrong. God doesn't just show us the way and prepare our way. God comes after us when we go our own way. That's the power of God's love for us, a love that pursues us. And that is our good news. God is our good shepherd. We don't need anything or anyone else to be the center of our lives. God is the one who protects and provides, who brings us together around the table, who pursues us with goodness and mercy. God is always with us. And for that gift, all God's people can say together. Amen. Amen. stand and join us for our last song.
Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. We will have fellowship time in the adult lounge right after. But before that, I pray that we would go out this week relying and trusting in God, the good shepherd, who gives us everything we need. The good shepherd who can be the center of our lives and our universe. And now receive God's blessing and benediction. May the living God go with you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, before you to show you the way, and in your heart to give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.